How'd you like to listen to .NET Rocks with no ads? Easy. Become a patron. For just $5 a month, you get access to a private RSS feed where all the shows have no ads. $20 a month will get you that and a special .NET Rocks patron mug. Sign up now at patreon.netrocks.com. Hey, welcome back to .NET Rocks. It's another geek out. Uh, it's that time of year. Yeah. Happy times. I'm Carl Franklin. That's Richard Campbell. He's got some goodness for you. Uh, you know, the funny part is these are hard to write right up until you're really pushing the deadline and then they get really fun to write. Like I stayed up late last night. Yeah. Double checking a bunch of numbers and really working on some aspects of this. So it's like once you get into it. If when you're deeply into it, like it's all in your head, it's it's really quite fun. But they are a lot of writing. It reminds me of when I used to stay up all night on Sunday nights uh, editing Mondays right. to publish on Monday morning. And crying, right? <laughs> Just absolutely <laughs> peeing myself, <laughs> laughing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, um, hey, uh, just a weird story. I just got a, a tweet from a friend of mine, which was a link to a TikTok video where he said, uh, and the title was, I've changed my mind, I'm embracing ChatGPT. Mm. He had a friend from New York who has a bagel shop who wanted ChatGPT to generate, you know, with Dally, a, a, a delicious bagel. Right. So it came up with something that looked fake and plastic and had cold cuts and some sort of spread on the bottom and lettuce and tomato. And then he said, make it more delicious. And it basically doubled the size of everything because <laughs> bigger means more delicious <laughs> and then he kept going make it more delicious and it, and he did this four or five times until it was like four feet tall <laughs> with a little bagel at the top and bottom <laughs> it just <laughs> just that's, terrible that's- do <laughs> you want any more proof that chat gpt is is u.s centric more is better more is better there you that's go right. make it more delicious that's so funny <laughs> i love it so uh i do have a better no framework so roll the crazy music well and we should do that yeah <laughs> What do you got? I went looking for the most expensive, coolest, highest rated electronic computer driven telescope that I could find on Amazon. Oh, because you can spend a lot of money on telescopes if you want. <laughs> yeah, this is no by far not the most expensive, no. but I think in the consumer category, it's right up there. And it's got uh, 1,873 ratings. Most of them are. With an average of 4.4 stars. So most of them are five stars. Uh, Celestron, Next Star 130 SLT, computerized telescope, compact and portable Newtonian reflector optical right. design. Rich is going to explain all this. <laughs> Sky Align technology, computerized hand control, 130 millimeter aperture. Uh, the only thing that I recognize there is computerized. <laughs> yeah, which is the important part because yeah. aiming a telescope well is very challenging. And so using the fact that we have ultra precise GPS these days mm -hmm. and great maps of the sky make it a lot easier to allow a machine to point very precisely for you. And honestly, I'm looking at this thing. It's less than $600. Like, this is a bargain for all the technology you're talking about. Uh, it looks really, really good. It, it also has this feature called Sky Align, where it can align itself to three or more celestial objects. Like, it, it just knows, based on the date and time and where you are, where things are in the sky, right? Right. And then it actually, to get even more precise, will do some pointing to try and get some alignments done so that it knows what it's doing. You know, there's a pretty cool. They, one of the things you find if you get into astronomy, it's one of the reasons I've stayed away from it. <laughs> when I've hung around with folks that are serious about their hobby is that setting your, your, your you know, you can't leave your telescope all, all the time. You don't have an observatory, you know, right. yet. Yeah. Uh, so you've got to set it up and then you've got to realign it uh, both internally and externally. So you've got it, you're figuring out, has it twisted? Is it too warm, too cold? All of those sorts of things Yeah. Uh, to actually get the telescope itself happy and then figure out where it is, how it's pointing. Mm. You know, all of these physical things about motors that turn your telescope, 
they're a little analog. They've got a little slack in them. And so mm. precision is really, really tough. It takes a lot to to get great results when you're going to go looking at things that are very far away. I wish these things were around when I was a kid. I yeah. mean, my, my father used to take us out and, you know, show us, you know, the constellations that we could see, Orion's Belt. and Yeah, which is great fun too, right? And you, and, yeah. and the sky map apps on your phone are awesome for that, for just holding up and going, oh, yeah, that really is Jupiter and that, right. that you know, that kind of thing. Because, yep. again, he leads on GPS. But now, you know, and my, my girls were kind of too young and not really interested, but I do remember the, um, I don't remember what year it was, but we had just an amazing meteor shower here. It was a Leonid meteor shower, I think it was. Mm. And, uh, I mean, my oldest daughter was probably six. So it was 2001, maybe, 2002. I can't remember, but it was. They come around every year. Well, this one was supposed to be like the the last one that was going to be this spectacular. Yeah. And as soon as you could see anything in the sky, it was like a meteor every two seconds. Right. So you don't have to maintain long attention span because it's just bombing. Or it's everywhere. Right. So I, I figured, um, Emmy and I went up to my mother's house and she has a big open field and there's no light pollution and stuff. And uh, I got her up at three in the morning when the moon was going to be down. So it was... It, Literally, we walked out three o'clock in the morning and sat out there and just in amazement. It's awesome. And it was it was the best meteor shower I've ever seen in my life. Here's the question when it comes to telescopes. As I keep talking about, you know, here being here on the ocean, yeah, the haze is a bit of an issue, but mm-hmm. we don't have a lot of light pollution because the people are pretty far apart up here. Right. When it actually goes to looking into the telescope, you go, you gotta kinda walk outside and and get your eye down on that eyepiece after it's aimed and sort of stare at it for a while. It's like mm-hmm. one person at a time. Is it as compelling if I put a CCD in it and then put it out on a screen so that everybody can see it? Well, the resolution is going to be lower on the screen. Yeah, to a degree. You're, you to know, a you're degree. right. Yeah. But then again, the telescope can zoom in on what it's looking at. Sure. The CCD, gonna- you know, I, you go for like a 4K resolution CCD to a 4K screen. Like you could try and optimize this to a degree. But I'm just thinking a night of sky watching, you know, in the winter when it's cold and clear out. Right uh, on the deck and being able to stay inside where it's warm and look on the screen at what we're pointing at. It's kind of compelling. I just, I don't know that that's as magical. It could just be TV then, right? As opposed yeah. to there's something about putting your eye over the eyepiece yeah. and seeing the thing. Um, I remember being on Grand Manan Island and going outside and looking up the, the most stars I've ever seen because there's like zero light pollution up yeah. in the Northeast there. And um, being able to see the Andromeda galaxy with binoculars. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. It's big. It's big. Uh, Big in the sky. No two ways about it. Yeah. But I, you know, I I fear, you know this about me. I fear new hobbies. Yeah. Just because you know know how I go, you know what's going to (laughs) happen. Yeah. I mean, did I, did I do some math for where I could put a little observatory in for an eight inch? Yeah. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> how many hours and how many dollars will this hobby cost me? Yes. It's like, yes. This, this is five figures now. It's like, time vampire. <laughs> am I going to be able to maintain a marriage through this hobby? <laughs> yeah, like, know, right? These are the pro- my problems. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. But if, you know, if grandkids come around and they're interested in it, yeah. I, I might get something like this. But, you know, you pulled up the perfect example of the middle ground, something you, mm-hmm. you know, under a thousand dollars, you could put in a closet. You don't feel too bad about it. When you mm-hmm. pull it out, you can make an evening with it. Yeah. Yeah. So, awesome. Yeah, that's it. Good choice. Uh, are you going to? Pull up a comment. Sure. Do we do, I, I got okay. one from last year's Space Geek Out. Great. Uh, that's 1826. And this comment's from Dave, who said, uh, you brought up Uranus at the end of the show. No jokes, please. Uh, which brought to mind this podcast episode I listened to a few months ago, where it sounds like they're actually going to get a mission to Uranus. And yeah, the wow. National Academies has proposed to NASA that we should be sending an orbiter out to the outer planets. Mm. So we've put uh, probes in orbit around Jupiter and Saturn, but we certainly have done Uranus or, or Neptune. They're very far away. Go two ways about that. Mm. Uh, and but they are unusual. Uranus, especially so, with an in, with a looks like a uh, an orbital inclination of almost ninety degrees, like the the planet's laying on its side. Like how did that happen? Mm. 
Not only that, but it looks like one of those shakes that you get in March at McDonald's. <laughs> the blue marble? Yeah. <laughs> the shamrock shake. You know, it looks like a I think ne- bluish Neptune's green. Neptune's more green. Uranus is very blue. But uh, Yes, yes, yes. That yeah. the I mean, some of the other proposals in that was t- that it probably makes most sense to use nuclear propulsion for that spacecraft. Hmm. And that would be the first mission where you're really like, Hey, we really need this. Like this, not mm. just RTGs, but something more advanced to provide more energy, mm. more speed. Like if you wanted to start testing more advanced rocketry, this is a good mission for that. I would, if I was designing such a rocket, I wouldn't fire up that nuclear reactor until I was outside, well outside the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, but it's not going to work otherwise, right? They, they, the heat problems and so forth, right? Yeah. nuclear powered space is complicated yeah. but you need a ton of energy you're way too far away from the sun for solar yep. Yep. Um, rtgs i mean the big problem here is that we've managed to get probes out to uranus like voyager but we did them by slingshotting so that by the time they got out there they were moving yeah and there was no way to stop them so to actually go into orbit around uranus is to be able to break mm. and that's a comp you need fuel you need resources mm. to mm. be able to slow down enough to to be able to stay there and really spend some time exploring uh, and that means a, a, either a much larger vehicle or some more advanced technology. And so hmm. uh, these robotic missions are the kinds of things that would open the door to advancing technology for all space flight going forward. And I, I think yeah. it would be a great opportunity. I hope, I hope they execute on it. But you are talking about a multi-decadal effort. Mm-hmm. Ten plus years to build and develop mm-hmm. a 10-year flight time. It's a mm-hmm. long way away. Mm-hmm. So, you know, someone would literally put their entire career into a mission, Yeah, you know, realistically. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for your comment and a copy of Music Go By. It's on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music Go By, write a comment on the website at .net rocks.com or on the Facebooks. We publish every show there. And if you comment there and I read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music Go By. And you can follow us on Twitter if you want. That's cool. We've been there a long time. But uh, the cool kids are hanging out on Mastodon. I'm... Carl Franklin at techhub.social. And I'm Rich Campbell at mastodon.social. Send us a toot. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And we won't make any comments about Uranus. We won't. Or the probe that's going (laughs) into Uranus. The probe going into Uranus? Yeah, okay. (laughs) Wow, we're not stoop that low. Yeah, yeah, full grade nine experience. There you go. (laughs) Speaking of Mondays, where's Mark Miller? Yes. We, I mean, you know, what's fun about these is I, I go read my notes from previous years mm. uh, and then laugh just about, you know, wow, oh, that we're going to, this will happen in 2023. Nope, didn't happen. Now it's pushed 2024, that kind of thing. Mm. But also, I'm sure things that you thought were going to happen in the next five years have already happened, right? Yeah. Some have, some haven't, you know. Mm. Uh, but let's talk about, I mean, our, the largest story to my mind for, for space flight 23 is spacex so elon's goal uh for 2023 was to have a hundred flights in a year Mm. which is astonishing right when you think not that long ago there were not a hundred flights of anybody uh, of all uh, in the whole world in a year yeah and even now it was we're around 209 flights for 2023 so we're talking half of all flights came from spacex although they didn't get to 100 Mm. at the moment and we're recording this in, 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 towards the end of December, there might be a couple more squeezed in before it's over. Hmm. Um, there are 94 flights. Wow. So 88 Falcon 9s with every single booster landed successfully. Uh, wow. Four Falcon Heavies flew uh, with side boosters recovered. They've never recovered a center and they're not even bothering these days. They're just too energetic. And the two Starship flights. Yeah. So even if even if they did one a day, from now until the end of the year, they still, you know, with weekends, they still probably wouldn't reach the goal. Yeah, it's pretty unlikely. And and part of the problem is that uh, December weather was very problematic. They mm. went 10, they, they've been at a cadence of every three or four days, they have a flight, a couple of week at mm. least, that's how you get mm. to 100. And they went 10 days on a flight in December, partly weather, mm. but also they have a Falcon Heavy flight that's, that's supposed to go, uh, was supposed to leave a while ago, back at the beginning of December. And it's mm. carrying the X-37B. So that is the Space Force Experimental Mini Shuttle, mm-hmm. uh, which is the first time it's ever flown on a Falcon Heavy. And in fact, there's a lot of debate as to why is it flying on a Falcon Heavy? 
because it can fly on a regular Falcon, hmm. uh, Falcon 9, and it has flown on the Atlas V and so forth. So they're doing something unusual in flying it on the heavy. They're get, obviously going to give it a lot more energy, maybe a much higher orbit hmm. or a much heavier payload. Nobody really knows. It's all very secret. But we get into one of the current, if you're going to run at this cadence of, you know, a flight every couple of days, yeah. the way that space flight works right now is somewhat inefficient. The big thing is that pads have to be configured for a flight. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the pad that they've got set up for this uh, Falcon Heavy flight can't fly anything else. It's really set up for that flight. Mm. And so when they had a weather delay, uh, that pad, obviously no, nothing was going to fly anyway. But then now they've had other problems with it to the point where they've actually taken it off the pad and back into the, um, uh, into the building to do some work on it. Mm. And in the meantime, that pad is hung essentially like do you reconfigure that pad back to fly something else or do you just wait for the heavy flight to finish and so on i remember when we were down in orlando for dev intersection just a couple weeks ago um the there was a starlink launch yeah and you know we were busy with stuff we couldn't have seen it but you know the the cape is only an hour away yeah you know theoretically we could have gone to see it but actually we could have just looked up yeah no i i that night i did go outside it was like a one in the morning yeah and you saw it in this you saw a light it's it's pretty brief it's like less than a minute mm. minute and a half and it's gone mm. yeah i think i was seeing the inside of my eyelids at that point <laughs> it just seemed very reasonable it was very late at night and we we and we're late in the conference too we we're always yeah so yeah i mean it, the elon said that his goal for 2024 is 144 flights and that uh, they're going to have to mm. continue to optimize their strategies for how you reconfigure pads, how you can put, if a vehicle has a problem, they like use the pad for something else, like those kinds of things uh, to maintain this kind of cadence. What's the benefit to Elon to do so many flights in a year? Well, in, you know, you bring up a great point, which is, uh, A, obviously, he can. He, the more efficient he gets, the more you reduce the price, right? The faster you run the machine, the more okay. you can tune it. Uh, he gets paid for a lot of those flights. Although, of those 88 Falcon 9 flights, 56 of them were Starlink flights. Oh. So, he, he's still populating out the, the, satellite, uh, the satellite network for Starlink. Hmm. They're now over 5,000 Starlink satellites, which means it's more wow. than half of all of the satellites in orbit. Or Starlink. Does he want to disrupt the land-based internet uh, cable modem market kind of thing? Um, I think that's possible. It's the the reality is that Starlink is about the same speed as a cable modem, more or less. Yeah, but it works out almost anywhere. I have one. I've had been in the in the early right. data, uh, but it's expensive. Yeah, you know. Although they, again, they're trying to get the price down. They've certainly made less expensive equipment for you to buy. Mm -hmm. it used to be, I think, almost eight hundred dollars. Now it's a couple hundred dollars. Uh, but they're also saying they now have enough customers that Starlink is actually profitable. Wow, that's cool. And one of his missions around Starlink was to fund uh, the trips to Mars off of the back of building this massive network. So huh. I mean, they're, they're so far ahead now. They have a working network. They have this huge number of satellites. And the other thing that's happened by flying these Starlink flights is it continues to mature the Falcon 9. Mm. So all of the most used flights, like they're up to one of the boosters has flown 17 times. They think they can fly it 20 times now. Wow. Those limit flights are always Starlink flights. So they're only risking their own hardware. Mm. Plus those Starlink flights are maximum weight. They're flying as heavy as they can fly. So they really are constantly testing the vehicle to its limits every time they make a Starlink flight, and it makes their rocket better. So you said they re have reused those rockets. The first stages, yes. The first stages. And that's that's something that was uh, supposed to be a feature of the shuttle, wasn't it? Well, the shuttle did get reused, but not the – and the boosters were refilled, and uh, the external tank was thrown away. The problem is that to get the shuttle ready for a second flight, there was such an extensive teardown. It was almost a rebuild, mm. and so it just became prohibitively expensive. Yeah. Uh, okay. and, it, and one of the problems you have with the shuttle is that it really only had one – technological update from the original design in the 1970s in the 90s they did a digital uh, upgrade internally but for the most part they never improved shuttle so over the 30 plus years that it was flying the technology was kind of frozen in place hmm. and uh and it was just old and it got older and so 
as it as the vehicle got the vehicles got older, their inspections became more and more extensive. So, in contrast, you said this was the Falcon Nine that they reused. Yeah, so they reused the first stage. Yeah, so they were they reused the first stage. How much of tear down and rebuild did they have to do to that? And we don't really know because it's not a public company. They don't have to tell us, right? It's oh, all yes, privately right. held. Yeah. But we do know that they're able to turn the same booster around in relatively short order. So we don't think it's very much. Hmm. Um, that they and again they're pressing against their own edges we're not really seeing failures like we haven't had an engine fail in a really long time on a on a mm. climb out so mm. they this it, it feels and more and more appears after hundreds of successful landings and reuses that they really understand the vehicle well i remember the couple of years of epic landing failures yes those are over are they yeah there hasn't been a failed landing in in ages yeah uh they all land they're all successful some of them land back on land some of them land on barges which is another point about if they're going to increase the numbers or they want to get to 144 they need at least one more barge yeah they just it takes typically those barges are far enough out that it takes several days to get back and so considering you're flying going to fly every other day or you know uh, every third day you're going to need another barge or two i remember uh, during those years you and i were sitting in a in a pub or a restaurant or bar at a conference and i can't remember where it was but it was somewhere in europe and mm-hmm. we were looking on the internet to to watch the reentry and it just blew up you know it was yep. one of those times where yeah. the landing just failed yeah and it's and, you know it's the problem with it being so routine now is we forget just how insane it is. I, it is pretty insane. Yeah, just, <laughs> I know <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, I went reached out on the Twitters or whatever the heck it's called now, the, the social media site formerly known about Twitter, uh, and said like, "What would you like? You know, any questions for me as I'm writing these geek outs?" And Stuart Quinn asked me about the environmental impact of so many launches. Mm, yeah, you know, the launch cadence has never been higher. Uh, SpaceX alone, with almost 100 flights this year, had lifted over a million tons into low Earth orbit. Mm. Like, it's just so much bigger. And we're starting to head towards this idea of more space tourism. So the flights may go up even more. Uh, Mm. Of course, they're expected to. Um, And the simple answer to this is, I mean, compared to air travel, space flight is just a tiny drop in the bucket. Yeah, but there have been carbon footprint measurements for keeping humans in orbit, specifically the astronauts on the space station. And yeah, that number is thousands of times larger than a human on Earth. And then again, but there's only a few of them. So then again, there's a volcano in Iceland right now that's spewing out tons and tons and tons of toxic gas. Yeah, it just happens sometimes. Not that much. It's not a. That's a good volcano. It's not that pyroclastic. But those are also normal cycles of the planet, and the planet recovers pretty quickly from this. Yeah, yeah. The actual emit rockets are such short duration. I mean, they burn Mm. a lot of fuel fairly quickly, but typical flight to orbit is like eight minutes. Mm. So compare that to a transatlantic flight like the the environmental impact per person because there's so many more people on a transatlantic flight yeah uh, are more efficient but and it also depends a lot on the fuel yeah um, the most polluting rocket engines are the solid rocket motors so look at you artemis and shuttle those uh are use uh an um, uh, aluminum ammonia compound and it's fairly toxic stuff again doesn't those only burn for a couple of minutes but still it's a lot you know speaking of that um comment that you read from scott Mm -hmm. i know this isn't an air travel geek out but yeah um are there any are there any updates in terms of more eco-friendly flight fuels slash methods that actually are interesting to you yeah not really but understand interesting is not a good idea anyway yeah. um they certainly continue to push on what uh, on zero carbon fuels but mm. those are fuels grown by algae and they're considered zero carbon because you're not getting new carbon out of the environment uh, out of the environment and adding it in this mm. is taking carbon that's already there you know you grow algae by consuming carbon dioxide mm-hmm. and then you're putting it back into the environment again as you turn it into jet fuel and burn it it's just much more expensive than traditional aviation fuel so i saw this past year on facebook and i don't know how and i've since uh you know hidden these posts or gotten rid of the messages but it was some sort of new science kind of you know stuff that people uh, crap science basically and and 
Yeah, it was snake oil science. So it was about this gigantic plane that is, you know, not built yet, but supposedly nuclear powered and can fly continuously around the earth. And basically you take a little plane and connect to it and then get on it and you can like live in it and there's swimming pools and communities. (laughs) It was just over the top. Well, and the U S military looked seriously at making a nuclear powered bomber to drop nukes. Because that it could fly continuously, it's just that to build a reactor with an, enough energy to keep flying like that, it's very heavy and it has and it's very dangerous. So yeah, especially if you if you blanket the Earth with nuclear bombs, what are you well, flying over or yeah, two yeah, can, or where are you going to fly? But where are you going to land? Kind of slow things <laughs> down there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm not. I don't particularly want to do a nuclear weapons geek out. We are not yeah. in a great time. No. Uh, with uh, nuclear safety. No, nope. but um, yeah, the the emissions around rocketry they're an issue. I mean, you would think that the hydrogen engines, the uh, hydrolox engines, like they used on the shuttle, the RS twenty fives, would be low emission. Except that they're so energetic, they don't just make water when they combine liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen together at, at with that energy level. They also make they rip nitrogen out of the atmosphere in the process and make nitroxes. They make hydroxyls. Like it's just a very energetic reaction. What about blimps? But it's small compared to the other emission sources. Uh, what about blimp technology? Has it gotten any better? I know you're not going to get there much faster, but... No, no, you're going to get there much slower. And yeah, no, the biggest blimp in the world ever is currently uh, being test flown. This thing called the hmm. walrus. Hmm. But then again, you could make a hotel in the sky with a blimp. Yeah. You know, that you would actually want to spend time. But you now you're having a long emissions while you're up there for ages, right? And yeah. you got to feed those people. So now you're yep. running supplies up to them. Like these ma- mm. this math gets difficult. It's better, better to travel in less time. And would they do a Dave Matthews train bridge uh, thing to get rid of the waste? <laughs> I, I don't want to think about what drops out of that thing. Yeah. All, All right. right. Enough, enough of that. We're talking, we, I'm going to, I want to wrap up on SpaceX by talking, talking about Starship because in 2023, we had the first flights of something that was starship shape. Yes, there was hoppers and things before that, but the the real stack, the largest rocket in the world, flew twice last year uh, on test flights. The first one was in April, on April 20th. Yeah, yeah, 420. Okay. In fact, I'm debating why. I still wonder why Elon did this flight. It made no sense. Hmm. It was an obsolete rocket design. They, were, they would never fly that configuration again. Hmm. It was an obsolete engine setup. And... You probably saw this on the news. It did tremendous damage to the pad. Like they yes. had lots of rockets, but they yeah. only had one pad. Yeah. And so when they rocket, uh, when, when the heavy booster ignited, three of the engines failed on ignition. Mm. And so the thrust to weight ratio was almost one to one. Mm. And so it climbed out really slowly and that just blasted the pad. It dug a 20 foot hole, a foot deep hole underneath the pad it blew concrete for miles around it blew dust even further there's great video of a yeah. of a camera an empty camera van nobody's in it but there's all these cameras on it just getting spiked by a chunk of concrete yikes like it, it was a um, and it was a bit of an environmental disaster that is yeah, a remember. sensitive wetland so yeah honestly it set the starship program back because it took time to fix it they put a water deluge system in to help suppress that which by the way they already had under construction like the parts were arriving even before the flight which gets Mm. back to why why would he do this flight and damage the pad and create all these problems yeah and i and it was really stunning you know a stumper for me the best idea i've had there's two thoughts one is he does have investors Mm -hmm. and they wanted to see something fly and so he, they were basically ready, let's go. How bad could it be? Not anticipating that he would shred the path. Mm. And the second was a recruiting problem, that, that this flight would be the flight that got new engineers on board. Because by all accounts, Elon burns smart people out. Mm, and yeah. so they were always looking for new talent. And somebody flying a rocket is compelling to those who want to make rockets. Sure. So, uh, and in the end, the flight did not go over. They still learned from it without a without a doubt. But yeah, they had multiple engine failures on climb out. Their separation for the fir- between the stages failed. 
um, their self-destruct failed too. So the oh, self-destruct system good. went off, but because the tanks are made of stainless steel, they held together for a couple of minutes before they finally ripped themselves apart. So it destructed in the sky and dumped yeah. into the ocean. And fell into the ocean. Yeah, That's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, the second flight did too, and many flights will as they learn. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not pleased with the first flight. It seemed like a really dumb thing to do. Yeah, somebody should have done the math about the pad. I mean, I think they had, but they didn't care. They didn't think it would be that bad. Uh, What's funny is going back over my notes from the 2022 Geek Out, I mentioned the fact that when they were doing static fires of Starship, they were talking about the amount of pad damage that occurred. Huh. So, I mean, they'd already done tests that we talked about that showed yep. how much damage was going on. Uh, but they fixed the pad. It took them a few months. Uh, it took longer to get FAA qualification and Fish and Wildlife had a say as well, but they got mm. through all of that. They added this massive water dilution system. So a huge amount of water mm. sprays up towards the rocket as the engines were light to decrease the acoustic shock and to sort of strengthen the whole system. All right. So then by this November, we're ready for the second Starship flight. Now, they've upgraded the pad, obviously, with the water deluge system and repaired all the damage. They've mm -hmm. also upgraded the rocket extensively, too. Better engines. They're now using electric gimballing instead of hydraulic, like the earlier flight, which they said they were going to use electric all along. Mm -hmm. They also changed the staging system. So, you know, traditionally in American spacecraft, they... The staging system is uh, a, a shutdown ullage system. So the, the lower stage will shut down, and then there'll be a little ullage booster to stabilize things, and the two rockets, the two pieces will separate, and then the upper stage will light. What does ullage mean? Ullage is literally little thrusters, okay, just enough to settle the fuel um, to be able to fire the next engine up. But mm. they, they do it as a cold stage. The two uh, pieces separate with all the engines off, mm. and then the upper engine fires up and off it goes. But that's not the only way to go about things. And Elon switched over to a hot stage. Now, okay. the Russians used hot staging for the Soyuz rockets. But this is where literally you light the engine of the upper stage while still attached to the lower stage, although rapidly they push each other apart. Mm. Now, this sounds bad, right? <laughs> like, yeah. So the way you do this is that you have an interstage layer between the two parts that has vents in it. So there's some place for the gas to go okay. and you armor the top of the fuel tank on the lower stage so that it can take the blast. And that's what they did. Okay. Uh, the upside to that approach is that it's, it's energetically efficient. You're able to fire the upper stage very quickly. Uh, mm. You don't have to wait for separation and stuff. So you ultimately are going to get more uh, Delta V into orbit. Mm -hmm. And that, so for the second flight in November, uh, it went pretty well. A, all 33 engines lit. In fact, they were gorgeous. Wow. You know, when these really high-performance engines run, they create this thing called a mock diamond, basically a shock wave coming out of the bell. And this is 33 of them. So there was literally a mock diamond of mock diamonds. <laughs> so the engines combined into their own uh, additional shockwave, which was it's just extraordinary to look at. Wow. And the first stage burnt its duration perfectly. And then they had to do separation, which is that mm. hot staging. And so what they did was they shut down most of the engines on the first stage, not all of them, mm. because the intent was to not attempt a landing, but at least attempt to fly the first stage away mm. when this is fully operational they are do want to recover both stages ultimately right mm -hmm. so they were going to attempt this so they they throttle down the engines but they have 33 engines still shut down so they didn't shut them all off at once because the shock would be too much mm. they shut them down in, in groups it was really quite beautiful to see the outer ring of engines shut off then an inner ring and then the next ring until it was just down to the three that were burning sort of at minimum power and then the upper stage lit and the gases blew out through the vents and the upper stage fired away. And then the lower stage started to maneuver. Uh, and then shortly after that had a rapid unscheduled disassembly. <laughs> yeah, I loved that. Yeah. Rapid unscheduled disassembly. Um, it, So did this happen while it was still inside the Earth's atmosphere or yes. outside? It's getting high. So, you know, atmosphere, there's not like there's a clear end to atmosphere here. No, no, no. Here. But, yeah. but yeah, they were they were pretty high up by the time of the staging. But it's, again, only a, a two and a half, three minute burn uh, before the separation occurred. So it brings me to um, a curious 
question, which is, and forgive my ignorance, but I, mm. I feel like I'm I'm not alone in this ignorance here. Um, when you're when you're swimming, you're pushing against water, right? right. And it's very dense, and yep. you can you can move fast, right? When you're in the Earth's atmosphere, you have gravity pulling you down, but you also have air to push against, right? right. When you blast those thrusters. If you're out in space, right, and you're not as uh, bound to the Earth by gravity and there's no atmosphere to push against, mm -hmm. when you fire thrusters, is there is it less effective because there's nothing to push against or well one would argue it's more effective because there's nothing holding you back either in the end right what what a rocket engine does is throws mass out its bell and yeah. that's what's you're that that's what's pushing your rocket forward right you're literally tossing that mass that combust that combusted fuel at velocity out the back you don't have to combust it you could literally just pressurize a, a nitrogen container and right. bleed that out and Poof. that will give you thrust as well but it comes down to the mass that you throw out the belt right so i imagine that's where the math comes in it's like what the cost benefit analysis of fuel expenditure to resistance i mean i guess you have that with every vehicle right well in the important part here is can you throw enough mass at high enough velocity the more velocity mm. you have the more net thrust you're going to get and so right. that's why we talk about these very high performance engines mm. Three thousand bar pressure inside that combustion chamber accelerates that burnt fuel at an extraordinary rate and mm. that that it turns into more effective thrust. Okay. And the atmosphere has very little to do with it. In fact, it's an impediment. The nose hmm. of that rocket was heating up as it was accelerating through the atmosphere because it was moving so quickly. And I suppose, you know, in getting back to the water thing, swimming through water takes more energy because you have more resistance. Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and we do all these hydrodynamic effects to try and reduce that resistance as much as possible. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so successful separation, it was beautiful. It looks like what went wrong with the first stage is they throttled down a little too much. And so the fuel stopped sitting at the bottom of the tanks and actually bounced upward in the tank. And then as they throttled back up, it slammed back down to the bottom of the tank and it broke things. Hmm. And so if you watch the footage of the first stage maneuvering away, you start seeing gas emitting from different directions, the kind of directions that said, that's not right. And then shortly after that, there was a, the rud, and it was not a commanded rud. So, I mean, there is a self-destruct system, and the software does make sure that the rocket is flying down its lane, the safe area it can fly in, and if it goes out of that lane in any way, it'll destroy it. Uh, that that didn't happen. Did Elon come up with that term, rapid, unscheduled disassembly? Un uh, unplanned disassembly? No, it's a, it's an industry term, but he does love oh, it. it. Is? He uses it a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and you kind of have it tongue-in-cheek now, right? It's, yeah. It's, everybody knows what you're talking about in wink-wink, you know? Yeah, and, and again, and the news often talks about, you know, Elon flies another rocket and it fails. But it's like, listen, this is what testing, dynamic yeah. testing looks like. No, I Instead get it. Instead of spending years planning and planning and planning to have one perfect flight, it's like you fly it, you blew it up, you learn. Yeah. And clearly there was progress between flight one and flight two. The upper stage, by the way, went on almost to orbit. It burned very well. Wow. Uh, but it did seem to have some, there was a point towards the end of the of the flight when it would have gone into orbit where the oxygen tank rate consumption went up. So I, with this, it's likely that it, the tank ruptured hmm. and started losing fuel. And once that had happened, now they did destroy it because they knew it wasn't going to get where it was. they wanted it to get to, and so it was safer to wreck it at, at its highest altitude hmm. so that the pro parts broke up as much as possible. That being said, an amateur astronomer in Puerto Rico who wanted to try and get pictures of it going overhead, managed to get footage of the a portion of the nose of Starship after destruction, tumbling. Wow. Wow. It was just an extraordinary <laughs> find to get that, that video. And it's amazing. But it's wow. like, yeah, no, that was that's the the header tank looks like it was still intact and still leaking fuel. And this silvery thing is tumbling end over end as it falls into the sea. Uh, wow. So an extraordinary second flight. They most important thing is they did not wreck the pad. Um, it, they, the footage afterwards showed that, that the liftoff 
did strip all the paint off of everything. Mm. And because it's right by the ocean, within hours, rust started appearing. So they do have to quickly repaint it and so forth. Uh, there is some damage to the pad. The quick disconnect systems were damaged. The launch mounts, the things that actually hold the rocket down until it's time for the liftoff, uh, all had to be replaced. Um, do you have a link to that video of the amateurs? Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll incl- yeah, I'll include it in the show notes, but yeah, there's, I'd love to see that. That both the, the, w- the second flight's amazing and the video of the, of the tumbling piece is amazing. It's all great. Hmm. So, um, obviously more upgrades to be done to the pad. Uh, they're changing the tank system around, mm-hmm. but for the most part, a very successful step forward. And again, largest rocket ever flown, both by height and by mass, fully fueled. That whole rocket was 7,500 metric tons. Wow. That's like the weight of a destroyer. Yeah. Right? Like, and you made it fly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's uh, they're wow. planning another flight for first quarter 2024. In fact, there's an intent to fly four starships next year in their learning because this is the vehicle that's supposed to become the lunar lander. Right. Um. In other rocket news, not a lot happened in 2023. Uh, we've been talking about Blue Origin's new Glenn, which is a seven meter rocket. This is Bezos's company. Uh, they did fire their CEO this year, and Bezos obviously has stepped down as CEO of Amazon, but he's still on the chair. He's got a new guy into Blue Origin. Mm-hmm. Um, new Glenn is years uh, uh, late. They've been moving some hardware around at the Cape, so that it looks like they've actually built something. And uh, he's ta- swearing that New Glenn's going to fly in the first quarter of 24. Mm-hmm. And then it's going to have a working payload. So their first test flight is actually going to be uh, a working payload, which is a little bit crazy to me. But okay, you do you. When you say working payload, you're not talking about people. No, spacecraft. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like they, often with first flights, they literally put a billet of concrete in. For the first flight of, of Falcon Heavy, Elon put his Tesla Roadster in. Right. It, yeah. Right. What a be- great shot that was yeah profound moment right profound. We, we, we talked about it we made a whole show around that yeah that whole, that whole moment but um normally for first flights you just use a dummy payload because the risk is high mm. but he's pretty confident and uh and so they're going to actually take a payload in their first flight cool. um the united launch alliance these are the guys who used to run the shuttle okay and then and have been running the atlas five and delta four uh, rockets, both of which are being retired, no more are being built. They're using up the last of them. Have a new rocket they've been developing for years called Vulcan. Hmm. Uh, also, a Methalox rocket like Starship, much smaller, a, a much more reasonable sized rocket. Okay. They promised that they would fly in 22, then they promised in 23. They still haven't flown. Hmm. Um, there is a rocket on the pad that they're doing testing with, and they swear it'll fly in 24. Okay. Uh, I'd also note that um, there are rumors flying around that United Launch Alliance is on the market. It's going to get sold, and it might even complete early in 24, one of the possible buyers being Blue Origin. What about Virgin Galactic? So Virgin Galactic uh, had their first paid uh, tourist flight. So this is the Spaceship Two, Mm -hmm. the thing developed originally by Burt Rutan. Uh, that gets lifted by the White Knight by this carrier aircraft up to about sixty thousand feet, and they drop it, and it fires a a very odd um, nitrox rocket engine. It gets up to about three hundred thousand feet above the Carmen line. You get about a minute or two of free fall, and then it reorients the vehicle, um, turns its uh, its tailplanes in this particular angle called the shuttlecock mode, so they can re-enter under control, um, and then it comes in for a landing. Hmm. Um, and you know, you can get your two minutes of, uh, of zero G for a quarter million dollars, something like that. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, they had their first flight and then they didn't fly again. They wow. swear they're going to fly again in 24 where new shepherd had a bunch of flights. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they were doing it. They had an unmanned flight, uh, with some experiments on board and the booster failed. The separation system worked perfectly. If people had been aboard, I think they would have been fined. It, it, mm-hmm. The separation system fired. The, the capsule landed uh, on parachute. The rocket was a total loss, and they have made some improvements. They say it was not going to happen again, and they're going back to flight next year as well. Huh. All right. Should we take a break? Yeah, let's take a break, and then we'll talk about the space station. All right. We'll be right back with more Geeking Out after these very important messages. 
And we're back. It's .NET Rocks Geek Out Edition, the Space Geek Out Show of 2023. I'm Carl Franklin. That's Richard Campbell. Howdy. The brain's behind this show. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you've never heard of Geek Out before, there's a lot of them. If you mm. just search for the tag Geek Out or search for Geek, yep. uh, you'll find them all. And uh, Richard likes to do research on a particular topic and then tell us what he's found. Yeah, a lot of these are notes I took throughout the year as I saw interesting things, but you still have this push at the end of the year to sit down and, and organize it, figure out what I missed, mm. you know, go back and check some things, double check some facts, you know, try to, and yeah. then you got to prioritize. These, this show's long, but mm. it could be way longer. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, International Space Station, not a lot of news. You know why? Why? It's busy. Well, it's the, you know, it's the, uh, 25th anniversary of the first components going up. The first operational mode was in 1998. And here we are in 20, 2023. And uh, it's at capacity. It has, you know, six six astronauts on it all of the time with other visitors on top of that. They are running the, mo- the most number of experiments ever run in a year was 2023. So they are at work as a laboratory. Was there some rumblings about shutting it down? Yes, um, and for a few reasons, one is it has a lifespan. Yeah. All right. Parts wear out. No two ways about it. The original plan was to run it till 2025. Now they're talking about trying to keep it going to 2030. Hmm. The oldest components are also some of the most vital components and they are Russian hmm. Hmm. and they're having more problems than the others. Now, you know, you can blame that on Russian hardware. The Russians have built a lot of space stations. Like they kind of yeah. know what they're doing, uh, but they're all kind of broke also, hmm. you know, wars notwithstanding. And they are still working together, you know, for as much as there's a conflict between the West and Russia, mm. the space station still depends on those two getting along. Mm. Um, the Russians have made noises about wanting to take their parts and separate from the rest of the station in 25. Screw you guys. I'm, I'm going, going home. home. <laughs> well, and there's a case to be made for some of the science lab parts on the U.S. side that are younger, that were yeah. flown in okay. the aughts, that still have another few years in it. In fact, Axiom Space, um, which is a group of former NASA folks, are starting to build their own space station, and they've been flying um, missions to the space station on Falcon 9 crew uh, dragons mm. uh, for money. And uh, so they want to actually build out uh, a free-flying space station by building it again, uh, connected to the International Space Station. Mm. And now there's a conversation going on about maybe they will take uh, the science module with them when they separate off uh, as the International Space Station is ending. So there's lots of debate about how to end it. One of the biggest issues being the International Space Station is the largest thing ever flown in space. It was assembled yeah. up there. It took a long time. It is very heavy. It's 450 metric tons. And so deorbiting it in a controlled way is, A, important mm-hmm. because that is going to – a lot of that mass will make it to the ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, B, complicated and expensive yeah they need to build they need to build a high power tug to actually decelerate it enough so that they can aim it for what they call point nemo which is in the southern southern pacific ocean that's where they generally drop old spacecraft because there's nothing there it's a safe place to to drop things off what i know about the iss is that it's modular yes so that in, in the international part means that well, Canada built a module, the United States built a module, and the, you know European countries, yeah, et cetera, Russia. So, I guess it's is it is it crazy to think that you could decouple the modules and replace them if they're wearing out? I mean, that's one of the thoughts. And if I think if conditions were better with the Russians, there is a conversation to be had about replacing the what they call the FGP or the main control module, but the conditions mm. aren't better. There's also never, it's never been done. One of the weird things that happens in space is that metals tend to fuse together. Really? So there is a question as to whether or not those components that have been, that have been docked together now for 20 years, whether they would come apart. We just don't know. Is it because the extreme temperature changes and things? Yeah. Yeah. And, and. Yeah, this is weird effect that happens up there with metal welding. You have these very flat surfaces and they meet up and over time they literally fuse together. They won't come apart. Wow. Uh, and so, you know, now you get into the economics of it. Is it yeah. cheaper to try and spend time 
dismantling this thing versus mm-hmm. just fly a new one. Now, and, and NASA has an initiative, initiative now for commercial space stations. So what they're saying is mm-hmm. we're not going to build another space station, but we will rent time on space stations. Here's what we expect from the space stations that we rent time on. Their goal mm-hmm. is to have multiple companies flying smaller stations mm. uh, at, with uh, that you can rent time on. Mm. These will probably be man-tended. The way they built the International Space Station with the limits of the technology at the time, there needs to be somebody on it all the time to maintain it mm. or you'll lose control of it. Mm. But technology is advanced enough now that we could be man-tended so that you could operate it remotely and then set it up for people to go visit it, spend a month up there, mm. and then come back down. Uh, there's also different kinds of experiments you want to do. The ISS is strictly a microgravity lab. Hmm. So there's, exa- for example, there is no experiments for centrifuges on there uh, because those vibrations affect other microgravity experiments. Hmm. So there's yeah. a case to be made for building centrifuges in a separate space station. Yeah, um, We need to learn to simulate gravity for humans to have extended sp- stays in space. We generally limit space station astronauts to six months on the station, and it takes them over a year to recover. Right. Uh, so could we put them in artificial gravity? Could we spin the space station so that they could uh, have enough gravity to stay healthy and be able to stay up for longer? Uh, and we've just never built anything that big. Yeah, weird things happen to your Weird things happen to your bones, your muscles atrophy. Like you, yeah, you lose you lose uh, calcium at a fairly alarming mass. rate. You yeah. need to do two and a half hours of exercise a day, even yeah. to slow that process down. There are lots of problems, and one of the solutions would be to create a centrifuge, a rotating ring, mm-hmm. so that you had enough gravitational effect to keep your body functioning normally. But we've never done it. Is that what uh, they had in two thousand one? Yes, a space odyssey, a centrifuge. Yeah, and and Kubrick being the crazy director that he is actually built one on a soundstage that rotated it's crazy because he was awesome yeah you know they the whole idea that we you never actually flew to the moon that it was actually a kubrick film it's like that might be true except that knowing kubrick he would have demanded to do it on set so they they <laughs> yes we hope i'll only do this but only if we shoot it on the moon <laughs> yeah Oh, man. Anyway, uh, I mean, that's uh, the space station is at its peak right now. It is doing the most work it's ever done. It is uh, an extraordinary achievement by mankind. It is a point of peace. You know, that's one place where they're not fighting. Uh, And it is coming to the to an end. I'm also excited that NASA is commercializing this the same way they've commercialized resupply of both crew and cargo. Now they're going to commercialize it for um Uh, for the actual station itself. Hmm. Hmm. Well, there's a good way to get money out of the 1%. (laughs) Something like that. Yeah. (laughs) The um, speaking of the resupply part of the space station, the, there are two resupply uh, offerings, right? They, there, there's the one from SpaceX with their, with their cargo dragon. And then Mm -hmm. there's also the one from orbital sciences, which is the Cygnus. It's now owned by, uh, Northrop Grumman. Okay. Uh, but they both resupply space station. Uh, And then on the crew side, there was crew dragon. There was supposed to be Starliner, which still isn't working. (laughs) Whose genius idea was that? Boeing. Boeing. Yeah. Had was going to build an alternative to crew dragon. They'd want to have redundancy. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's gone so badly. They, they did their one test flight to the station successfully after on their second try. Hmm. And uh, then they found so many problems. They've now delayed the next attempt, the next test flight to 2025. Wow. But one of the competitors for the cargo resupply missions was the Dream Chaser. This is a little lifting body based on the NASA's HL-20 that looks like a mini shuttle, basically. Mm-hmm. Made up of two components. You have the space the, the spacecraft that can reenter, and then there's a cargo module that bolts onto the back with solar panels and stuff on it that you leave hmm. behind. Uh, lifted on a rocket, so it typically was supposed to fly on Atlas V. Now we fly on a Vulcan. Wings fold up to fit in the payload fairing. Mm-hmm. But it lost. But they kept working on it anyway. And with all of the problems around Starliner, NASA is now supporting Dream Chaser, and Dream Chaser is ready for a test flight. Hmm. So this uh, will actually be able to do resupply to the station. No crew yet, but who knows in the future. What's interesting is that it re- it has a return payload capability. So the Cygnus craft, the one done by World Sciences, lifts yeah. more to the station than the orc than Cargo Dragon can, but it has no return. So it just burns up in the atmosphere on the way down. 
uh, Cargo Dragon does have a return. They have a heat shield, so they're able to, to recover payloads. So you can do experiments in space and bring them back. The problem is that it's a capsule. So A, it, it re-enters under uh, high gravitational stress, so that can damage your experiments. And it lands in the ocean, which is an environmental problem. And then it has to be recovered, which means if you've got a delicate experiment, say something that has to stay refrigerated, that kind of thing, yeah. it's at risk. If, uh, if Dream Chaser starts working, it can return payload back to Earth, but it can also land on a runway. Hmm. So A, a lot less gravitational stress, and B, uh, you know, quick back into under controlled environments so you can recover an experiment quickly. So there is a case for for Dream Chaser, and they are pretty far hmm. along. They're supposed to fly. They're supposed to be the second flight of the Vulcan. So Vulcan's been delayed a lot. The first flight for Vulcan is supposed to carry a payload to the moon brave but okay mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. the second flight is supposed to be in april of 24 and it's supposed to be the dream chaser test flight to the station no payload just a test flight um but exciting new vehicle yeah that is exciting and one that could be turned into a manned vehicle at some point wow do you uh personally want to take a flight when it becomes feasible into space you know that might be too late for me yeah I just, you know, we we were just at Dev Intersection, and we, mm-hmm. I went to, you know, we rented out uh, part of Universal Studios for the party. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I went on a couple of those Hogwarts rides, <laughs> and I was damaged. <laughs> <laughs> With or without scotch. So. Yeah, I was pretty sober <laughs> <laughs> to the point where I'm like, this is not smart. And so, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I would my I my head really wants to go. My body's like, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, I don't know. It's a great question. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm 56, and yeah. so you know, who knows? We'll we'll see. So let's talk a little bit about the moon because we yes. got stuff going on the moon. Yeah, uh, there were a bunch of landers that went to the moon in 23. Uh, one of them was the Russia Luna 25. The mm-hmm. previous Luna 24 was in the 1970s, but apparently mm-hmm. they dusted off the old design and tried to fly to the moon ahead of the Indian lander. Also um, China, right? China has already been on the moon. They landed on the far side of the moon a few years ago, Yeah, uh, uh, which was astonishing. It was the first, hmm. and uh, that lander, I think, and rover is still functioning. Wow. Uh, but India uh, had a flight, and then Russia jumped in out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. They did get to the moon before the Indians. They just landed uh, with bigger big with anyway you could see if you go search online for the luna 25 landing you can see the blast mark where it hit the the moon at several kilometers per second oh it wasn't a manned moon flight then no no there's no there's been no new man moon flights so far okay uh these are all uh remote control landers and some in some case rovers so the so the russian flight was more like a missile yeah something like that they were attempting to land they were in their their landing burn uh, and there was some kind of malfunction, and they lost control, uh, and it and it hit the moon with vigor. Now the same thing happened. We've had a bunch of landers go that way, including an Indian one yeah. that uh, that impacted hard, and an Israeli uh, lander a couple of years ago also wow. impacted hard. Landing on the moon is hard. Yeah. That being said, uh, the Indian space program is serious business, and they continue to work on this problem. And in August this year, uh, Chandrayaan three soft landed a lander and a rover on the south pole of the moon first time ever that's so cool they are only they're only the fourth country to soft land on the moon yeah america russia china india wow the japanese have a lander on the way to the moon as we're recording this supposed to really? land sometime in 2024 and we wish them you know all the best yeah that's great uh the artemis missions there was no artemis mission in 23 there was an Artemis mission. In, it was an unmanned Artemis mission. This is NASA's moon rocket okay. derived from space shuttle parts. Yeah. All right. And, and understand, this rocket is a political rocket. NASA, I, as near as I can tell, NASA doesn't want this rocket. But understanding that NASA is funded by Congress mm-hmm. and that over the evolution of the space shuttle program, every single state in the union participated in the space shuttle program Mm. and so that's a lot of jobs Mm -hmm. and so when the space shuttle program ended in 2011 congress refused to stop funding it and so what they would what they were funding then was re-implementing space shuttle related parts into a rocket now there's a Mm. case to be made here the space shuttle itself weighed almost 100 tons Mm. so if you get rid of the shuttle and just use the engines and the tanks Mm. 
100 ton lift to orbit is a lot. That's Saturn V class moon rocket technology. Right. And so there have been several versions of this over the year. Believe me, this idea of repurposing shuttle technology into a rocket was an awesome idea in the 1990s. Yeah. Okay. Now it's obsolete, but it has continued. It costs billions and billions of dollars. The current estimate for the Artemis One flight was four billion bucks. And it's really because of constituencies that don't want their jobs taken away. That's right. They don't want to have to say to their constituents, yeah, we've shut that program down, find a new job. Is it really that simple? I mean, is that the only reason? No, it's not. It's not. It's not. I mean, it's easy to say that, Carl, but the, the other side of this is these are skilled people. They're not replaceable. Yeah. There isn't new ones, right? You do have to train people up in this. And so losing that skill set is an issue without a doubt. That being sure. said, this is a primitive rocket. Relatively speaking, it's insanely powerful, but it's still using hydrolock extensions on its first stage, which is kind of insane, right? They, because the fuel density is so low. That's mm. why that tank is massive, because the hydrogen tank is eight times the size of the oxygen tank. If they were using methane, the tanks would be about the same size. Hmm. Uh, and they've extended the, the booster stage. And then the Orion capsule is an extraordinary capsule. The upper stage still needs to be improved. They did announce... Uh, the Artemis II flight uh, in 23. This is a manned flight to go around the moon, you know, sort of like uh, the Apollo 8 mission in 1965. Yeah. They're just going to go around the moon. The, the Artemis I flight was unmanned. They sent the Orion capsule around the moon, and they did some really interesting maneuvers with that Orion ca- capsule. They, they know more about gravitation than they've ever known before. They did some mm-hmm. interesting gravity tricks. But the second flight is going to be a straight-up free return send humans around the moon for the first time in 50 plus years. Wow. Uh, They probably won't make the 24 date. They're behind schedule. Mm -hmm. They have selected the four astronauts, three Americans, two men and a woman, and one male Canadian. Hmm. So there's going to be a Canadian going around the moon, which sounds cool until you realize we're trading. We know we're able to fly a Canadian into space because we contribute to the program and we're using up our flight in a, in a, uh, around the moon flight rather than a lander flight because Artemis three is supposed to be actually landing on the moon. So okay. it's a trade off. You know, when you, when you mentioned the Artemis program, um, I can't help think of the tension between, you know, the private sector, i.e. SpaceX et al and the government and NASA. And isn't there any kind of creative way that these two things can benefit each other well, and one would argue they have because NASA put out to bid the lunar lander and SpaceX won it. Right. So the lander part of the Artemis three mission is this commercial vehicle. And, and to be clear, it's a commercial company that's building Artemis. It's United Launch Alliance. Yeah, okay. Right? The guys who built the shuttle. But they're being funded by the by the Congress, though. Yeah, but then again, so is the lunar lander missions, right? Right, but SpaceX isn't. No, no space, SpaceX absolutely is, but getting contracts from the U.S. government okay. to resupply the space station, to ship, a, to, to fly crew up there, okay? I see. Now, you can argue about the type of contract, which is a legitimate argument. Yeah, Right. Yeah. The the Artemis missions are very much based on a cost plus contracting model. So it's like mm-hmm. these are deliverables, you know, make an estimate of the budget. But if it runs over, whatever, if you make if you stay in budget on time, you make a bonus as opposed mm-hmm. to the commercial resupplies missions, which is we will pay this much ton to orbit this much ton for return. How you do it up to you. Here's the cadence we want and how much we right. move. Right. And so the. There's an incentive in those commercial contracts to be cost efficient. And there's a disincentive in the cost plus missions to be cost mm. effective. Yeah. Right. So the structure of the contract matters a lot. The, you know, the argument in favor of cost plus contracting is you're doing new research. You're doing something nobody's ever done before. See James Webb, mm-hmm. right? A one of a kind vehicle. And. So we don't know how much it's going to cost, really. Here's our guess, but Mm. as we develop it, we're going to run into problems and it'll cost more. But Mm. building the same rocket over and over again is not an experiment. Yeah, that's right. So (laughs) you should probably do it. And it's also a known chunk of science now, right? So it it does make sense to to get this out of the way. And given that Starship starts to function, eventually it's going to be silly. Uh, And having United Launch Alliance sold to another entity – 
You know, is that going to make it more lobby centric or less lobby centric? Like all of this is very interesting for how it's going to evolve. Well, and then there's just the idea that, you know, these these people, if they don't like their government jobs, could go apply at SpaceX, you know, or 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 other places. Possibly. Yeah. It's just a question of are they willing to work the new way, too? Right. You know, arguably SpaceX was founded on the back of a group of frustrated rocket engineers who really wanted to fly stuff and didn't want to, you know. Congress may have funded the, the the project, but they funded it minimally, not enough to actually build any hardware for a really long time, literally for decades. Hmm. So shuttle stopped flying in 2011. Hmm. And the first yeah. flight of Artemis is 2022. That's a long time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, the the gave them enough money, barely enough money to actually build anything. Like if you really wanted to move this, you would have spent more yeah, or okay. shut it down. That being said, at this moment, Artemis is the only thing to carry people beyond Earth orbit. You know, maybe Starship will someday, but Starship has only flown twice and went big Once boom both times, right? Like we're a long way away from it being a working vehicle. And yeah. so they had, and they have commitments for Artemis. Uh, they have, they had 16 engines left over from the shuttle program. That's what they were using. They used four per flight. So the first four flights of Artemis uh, have engines. They're now cranking up the production to make new versions of these engines very expensively to mm-hmm. to do another to plan out another four Artemis flights. But these okay. are flights to the moon. And uh, one of the questions I got on Twitter was from Bob Archer. He says, are we going to have a base on the moon before we go to Mars? It's like that seems to be the plan. But we're not that far along on that plan. No, there. Mm. Are, but first off, there are no real plans to send people to Mars. Not really. Elon talks about it. Right. Just a desire. But it's not, it's not real. There are no missions. There's no permission. Nothing's set up. Nothing is real yet. Yeah. Do we have real mi- plans to put humans on the moon? Well, yes. Uh, build a base? Not mm. so much. But you remember, I, in 2017, I did that moon base uh, geek out. And I encourage you to listen to it. And that was based on reading papers by both the European Space Agency mm-hmm. and NASA about building bases on the South Pole. Very much like Antarctica man tended bases that you probably stay at for a month a month and a half at a time to do original science on the moon there's a lot of things to learn up there if i remember correctly there was some influence that you had uh on nasa itself you richard campbell well one day after we did that podcast together you and i in early 2017 later in 2017 nasa called yeah now which is crazy when you think about it <laughs> but you also know that's not no. the first time, right? When we did the Space Telescopes yeah. Geek Out, yeah. NASA called and said, hey, would you like to come and meet a Space Telescope? We got a James <laughs> really awesome. over here. And we're like, well, <laughs> yes, yes, we would. <laughs> and we also interviewed Greg yeah. Tooley about the, the uh, plasma mm-hmm. dynamics uh, mission he was working on and a bunch of other stuff. And then we went, and remember, we went into that back, mm-hmm. the back warehouse and saw the test kit for fixing oh, Hubble yeah. and like just yep. in storage. It's this you know, giant as tube of epoxy. With a wooden spatula. Yeah, it's no, crazy. it wasn't. I'm kidding. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah. So when I got reached out to by the NASA Ames group about that moon base podcast, they asked me if I would do a talk on it, which, by the way, I'm still doing. Yeah. But you did it to NASA. I did it to NASA themselves, yes. And and what, you know, Richard is very kind and not braggadocious, but he connected the research from several different departments in NASA that weren't really talking to each other and presented it to all of them at the same time. So, yeah, that's that's what ended up happening. And it was good. I think you had some influence there. I hope so. Uh, I get some nice I get messages from the, some of those folks routinely as the work is ongoing. Yeah. The work is ongoing. Uh, the getting to the moon is really hard. And the lander is the heart is one of the hardest parts. We don't have a good lander. The lander we had, the old Lem, was a very dangerous machine. And we wouldn't use that today. We need a better lander. We need a we reusable need, lander. And we need something more than a Commodore 64 on board. <laughs> well, it's not just the compute power. It's do you is it it has to be big enough to be yeah. fully reusable. The old LAM had a descent stage that you left behind. If you're gonna build a base, mm. you can't keep leaving bits behind each time mm. you visit it, right? Like that become eventually you run out of room. Mm. So we need a re- fully reusable lunar lander. And for better or worse, the only proposal for a fully reusable vehicle is Starship, mm. is Elon's giant rocket. Once it works. Now it has problems. <laughs> it's very, it, once it works, it's yeah. very tall. It's very large. 
and has a huge payload, which is awesome. But the people are at the top part. So you're, A, you got to land this thing on something pretty flat because you don't want to tip over. That would be bad. And then once you have landed, you're still like 150 yeah. feet in the air. So you're going to need an yep. elevator. <laughs> you got to have to get this stuff down. Like, I wish we could come up with a better design, but this is what we've got. Jeffrey's tubes. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> uh, that being said, because uh, that is obviously in process, you know, there's a discussion about building a better mm-hmm. lunar lander. Uh, I ran across a capability study by DARPA. Remember DARPA? Of course I remember DARPA. So this is the Defense uh, Advanced Research Projects Group. I find DARPA to be very serious individuals. These are the ones in the early aughts that started on automated mm-hmm. driving that's led us to a lot of what you're seeing now with well, and smarter and smarter cars. Go back even further. That was the origins of the internet. Yep. The internet mm-hmm. comes from there. So when, when DARPA and they're also tackling problems with uh, mm-hmm. neural nets, just, you know, understandable AI, uh, I take DARPA's research stuff seriously. They're also the ones to say there isn't a good solution here and end it. Like, Often my problem with a lot of science papers is these scientists want to Mm. stay employed. So they'll always write a paper that ends with give me more money (laughs) and I will do more. Right. Where DARPA will say, ah, this has gone as far as it can go. We're done because they're funded regardless. They're funded by the military. Incentives. That's what it's all about. Yeah. So uh, DARPA has started what they call the Luna 10 capability studies. So this is literally about commercial moon technology. Okay. By 2035. So in the next decade, can we mature power, mining, in situ resource utilization, communications and navigation, logistics systems, constructions and robotics, all the things to create a commercial space on the moon? Now, it's a capability study. So what they're really doing is setting a bar. Is this feasible? You know what it's going to end up being, buddy? Freaking Walmart. <laughs> You know, Walmart goes where the customers are, and I don't think they're oh, there they're yet. Uh, for better or worse, I'm afraid this is going to be Space yeah. Force. Yeah, I'm not kidding. This is going to be. But at the same time, like, ex- maturing the ability to extract water ice yeah. from the moon to be used as fuel for interplanetary travel. So rather than keeping on bringing the fuel from Earth, and that heavy gravity will, you can take it from the moon. Could mm-hmm. be cost effective. I mean, we've talked about you know, my original moon base talk going all the way back to 2017 is what could you do on the moon? It's cost effective. And uh, generating electricity is an interesting part of it. Building solar panels, uh, resource extraction, construction. The gravity well of the moon is much, much yeah. lighter. And so if you're going to do stuff in space, it makes sense to work from there more than work from here. As in difficult as it is. is. is th- are there any resources available deep in the moon or is it all pretty much one just big chunk of the same kind of rock no it's uh interesting you ask that because it doesn't have it has some geological activity Mm. it does seem to have some core and there was volcanic activity on there really but there's also mass concentrations that represent large asteroid strikes so they are surface mineral concentrations okay so they represent potentially valuable resources as well Mm. but in the end the moon is mostly made of aluminum you know, and uh, and silicon, like pretty normal substrate materials mm-hmm. that are useful. No two ways about it. Like you can, you should be able to uh, to do some useful mining there and to get resources uh, put together. Yeah, you just got to mature the technologies. We don't know enough yet. We just got to start small. And you need the energy to run all of these extraction machines and all that stuff. Yep. And that means maturing forms of yeah. power generation on the moon, which is right on that list. It's got to be number How do we, one. You, know, we, you think it would be solar, except for that whole, hey, it's dark for 14 days thing. That's problematic. So uh, now we get into some of the Stirling engine-based nuclear like Krusty, uh, which are you know 10 kilowatt solid state uh, mm. reactors. So there's lots of possibilities okay. there. Anyway, to back to Bob's comment, yeah, we're definitely working on a base on the moon. It's a long, got a ways to go yet, but more is happening in the past couple of years than has happened in the previous hmm. 30. Pretty cool. 2023 was a great year for asteroid exploration. Okay. Uh, the OSIRIS-REx yeah. mission. So this is a mission from a decade ago that actually landed on the surface of OSIRIS-REx and picked up some uh, samples of that asteroid. Jeez, was it really 10 years ago? It seems like yesterday. Yeah, I know crazy uh that capsule made it back this year intact perfect landing 
Uh, there was a little bit of problem with the parachutes, but it still worked out fine. Uh, the only problem they have now is that they picked up so much, so many rocks mm-hmm. that it uh, they can't open it. It's jammed. Oh, no. <laughs> but you got to imagine they don't want to contaminate these rocks. These are pristine rocks right. from an asteroid, right? In a sealed container. So they want to work in a vacuum, you know, with remote controls, essentially, to minimize any exposure to these rocks so they can test them, per, you know, without so any So a sawzall effects. is not really but an they, option. <laughs> yeah, this is the problem, right? Like, they, they can't get the bolts out. They're jammed. <laughs> so, Bummer. So they have to come up. How do we open this without contaminating right. it, right? Like, that's the battle is, uh, you know, we got these rocks from Bennu. And now we got to try and uh, and get them get access to them without Jeez. contaminating them. So I mean, these are so many good things have yeah. happened. They success successfully the mission. It even came back, and now they're just down to this one teeny little problem: <laughs> can't open the can. <laughs> uh, also, this year we launched a new mission to a new asteroid to the Psyche asteroid, which is believed to be a planetesimal core. So you know this idea that there was a planet between Mars and Jupiter, and that's why there's a huge asteroid field between the two? Okay. And this is where some of the biggest asteroids in our solar system, uh, like Ceres, uh, live in that particular space. Well, Psyche is one of them, but it is a metallic asteroid. So most asteroids are carbonaceous. Mm. Uh, They're mostly carbon compounds Mm -hmm. and rubble piles. Uh, This one looks to be solid metal. Mm. And so the ore value and it's astonishing. It's massive. So they've to the Psyche mission is going to uh, take a good look at it. And it's going to take a few mm-hmm. years to get there, but it took off in September. Oh. So it's on its way. Uh, one more asteroid related mission. And this is about DART, which we talked about yep. last year because Brian Schroer asked, Hey, what did we learn from mm-hmm. DART? So DART was the mission to see, can we modify an asteroid's path? Right. You know, one of the things that makes us different from the dinosaurs besides, you know, Candy Crush is we can see him coming. We can see him coming. Maybe we yeah. can do something about him. And so the DART mission was our first attempt. We found this perfect binary system for doing the testing. A, we can observe it. It orbits mm. beyond the Earth, but we can get good images of it. It's actually a two uh, asteroid system. So the, the big asteroid is uh, called uh, Didymos, and Dimorphos is its or, is orbiting it, and so the impactor actually hit Dimorphos, the smaller okay. one. They call, or they, can, uh, they can call it Diddy Moon <laughs> if you like. Um, we talked again. We talked about this in last year's uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Space Geek Out. Uh, it hit it successfully. They and it reduced its orbit by about hmm. a half an hour. So it, we really did do something, and, and now we've continued measurements of it, and we've figured out we probably blew as much as a, a thousand metric tons of mass off of Dimorphos with that impactor hmm. because it was a rubble pile. They're, they they are still tracking boulders that were blown, big bigger boulders, 20, 30 feet across that were blown off of it in the impact and are now orbiting on their own. Wow. So, uh, and they're not done next year in 20, in, in October 24, there's a mission called Hera by the U- European Space Agency to go back to, uh, Didymos and Dimorphos to take more readings. So we are learning to yeah. protect ourselves, right? That it looks like the impactors were far more effective than expected. Wow. That's and, good news. Uh, it, it it opens the door to we would have a chance. Now, when you say it delayed the orbit by 30 minutes, the orbit of the little one around the big one or the orbit of the big asteroid around us? That's right. The, the little round around the big one. And so that does what to the orbit of the big one around us? Nothing. But but that's one of the things we want to test. So far, we can't tell because the mass of the big one is I so see. much bigger. Like, believe me, we still have a long yeah. way to go, right? Like. This asteroid wouldn't have been particularly dangerous in the first place, but it was a, a th- right. something to test with, and uh, and we, you know we yeah. learned from it without Very a doubt. Very cool. Uh, yeah, it's it just you know we we talk about science pretty abstractly, but this was pretty yeah. darn real, right? Like this is this is our first real test. Mm-hmm. So, uh, just I'm just pulling up the old notes from last year. So, Dimorphos is about a uh, 500 foot across rock weighing about 4.8 million metric mm. tons, orbiting about a kilometer off the surface uh, of uh, Didymos. And it took about 12 hours to do an orbit. Wow, that's big. And now it does it in 11 hours and 23 that's minutes. big. Because of us. 
Well, the big one is is twenty five hundred feet across, like yeah. half a mile across, and weighs five hundred and twenty metric tons, or five hundred twenty million yeah. metric tons. There's one thing that you brought up in one of these older space geek outs, which was mining uh, precious metals in asteroids, like yes. gold and stuff, gold and, and platinum. platinum. But I mean, just think about gold for a yeah. minute. Like, if you mm -hmm. doubled the amount of gold immediately on the market in the world, would the price go down? Catastrophically, but you wouldn't double it. You would you would increase availability by a hundred times. Okay. Right. Like that's the real problem. If you if you talk about Psyche, that mission that's yeah. headed up there, it's very likely there are platinum class metals up there. Yeah. And you extract them and you bring them back. Like you'll just you'll crash well, the platinum market I can understand because you use but, it in cell phones and things like that. And that makes yeah, everything well, cheaper. You have but gold. gold is something that, you know, people hold on to and invest in and feel is special and precious and well, people people invest in all sorts of metals but yes you would absolutely crash the market on it. and gold has important use yeah, industrial yeah, uses yeah. too right admittedly it has an un because of its non-reactivity and ability to be mm. manipulated it has a special place in a lot yeah. of people's hearts but it's also shame um yeah it's, <laughs> it's also a question of the just the cost it is yeah. dumb to spend that much yeah. money to get up there just to bring the stuff and, back down and reduce the value use it of it there. worldwide mm. You will absolutely tank mm. the market, without a doubt. Did you hear that, Yuval? <laughs> there you go. So let's uh, take a break, and then we'll talk space telescopes. Okay, we'll be right back after these messages. All right, we're back. Break number two, the Space Geek Out 2023. I'm Carl Franklin. That's Richard Campbell. Howdy. And... Uh, yeah, we're, I know this is a long one, but there's just a lot to talk about. Well, now we're getting to the part you right. asked me for, right? Which is the crisis in cosmology. Yeah. But first, let's, uh, we've got to talk okay. about Hubble first. So, uh, originally a space station, one of the great observatories. It was uh, lifted mm -hmm. on the space shuttle. Uh, mo it's a modified spy uh, mm -hmm. satellite. It's been operating. It had pro optical problems. They got corrected in the 90s. Bum with the squeegee smeared the uh, lens at the stoplight. That was the <laughs> a little more complicated than that, but yes. <laughs> Last service mission by the shuttle was 2009. Yeah. Now there are no mm -hmm. more shuttles. Uh, it counts on a set of six gyros. You understand in, in the orbit it's in, it was about 400 kilometers up. For it to point in an area of space as it's whizzing around the Earth, these gyros continuously move the, right. the telescope to keep it pointing yeah. in the same direction so you can do your observations. It's like a, a, a camera on a gimbal. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so these gyros fail over time. They were something they replaced ever, on every servicing mission. There mm. were several of them. And now it's been since 2009 that they've been replaced, and they're down to three, and they're starting mm. to fail. Uh, and so there is a question of what to do. And it's, you know, for all of the years of Hubble, it seems a shame to just abandon it. Uh, so It's already uh, outlasted its, its, its predicted life. Oh, by miles. And it, but, you know, it, it was the first of the serviceable yeah. satellites, right? It was mm -hmm. an experiment to see, can we service a satellite? They upgraded the solar panels. They upgraded, they replaced instruments many times. They fixed it. And they certainly kept replacing the gyros. There is a proposal. There's two proposals. One of the things they did in the 2000, last 2009 mission is they put a prototype of the universal adapter on the bottom of, right. of Hubble. Hubble was set up to be able to be picked up by the shuttle, but nothing else. But they, this adapter is what they call a pedal adapter, which is what we use now for uh, mm -hmm. docking. Although the, the current modern one is a little bit different than the, what's on Hubble right now, yeah. but that's fine. What we have is a place that a robotic vehicle or another vehicle could grab onto designed to be grabbed. It's sturdy. It's a locking, a lock on point. It's on the bottom of Hubble. So the first off is if we lose control of the gyros we're, and it's low on fuel, um, we could have an uncontrolled deorbit from it. Although it's fairly high what? up that it'll take a while, an uncontrolled deorbit. De ah. It'll yeah. There's, there's not a lot of atmosphere at 400 kilometers, but it's mm. still a little, just like the mm -hmm. space station, which is at two at around that same height, you have to keep mm -hmm. reboosting it. So we lose control of it. We can't do that anymore. Eventually, it'll reenter. And it's pretty, no, pretty, uh, you know, low thing to treat one of the most celebrated satellites of all yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And let's face it, it would fit inside of Starship. <laughs> like if Starship gets up and running, 
in theory, they could, they could use Starship to go pick up Hubble and bring it back. <laughs> like, doesn't it deserve to be hanging in the Smithsonian? Absolutely. You know? How big is Hubble? Did you say how big it was? Yeah. Well, Hubble fit in inside the payload bay of the space shuttle, yeah. obviously. That's okay. how it was launched. So it's about 40 feet long and about 14 oh. feet across. Yeah. It's big. You know, it's bus, bus okay. sized. Yeah, that makes sense. Know? Yeah. And, uh, but the other question is, like, it's ob- it's still useful as an mm. observatory. Why not just keep maintaining it while it's still able to work? All we got to do is replace the gyros. Right. But really, there's so there's two missions. The first is, can we keep yeah. it under control? So at least decide if we're going to retrieve it. So get, send a mission up there to boost it and maybe to provide guidance. So you can imagine a little tug that would attach onto the back of Hubble. Even if you're not going to still use it as a, as a, uh, mm-hmm. a, a telescope, at least keep it under control. Yeah. Maybe even build a module like that that could do its pointing for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know if you remember this guy. Uh, Jared Isaacman is this billionaire uh, adventurer, and he had the first uh, tourism flight oh. to orbit uh, where he flew. Uh, he, he, t- he, he bought a crew dragon, raised a bunch of money for, for children's hospitals mm-hmm. while doing it. But uh, and took three people with him up in and spent three days in orbit in a crew dragon. Okay, so he wants to go back. He wa- he's not done. He, he you know flying his MIGs isn't enough. He wants to go back into space yeah. again. And so he's part of proposing to. Uh, he has a mission c- currently in planning now with Elon to do the first cons- uh, commercial spacewalk. Okay. He wants to oh. walk in space, not as an NASA astronaut, as as a, as a hmm. citizen. So they're working on a suit. It would be tethered, Mm -hmm. but he would take a crew dragon up with a couple of other people. They would depressurize the capsule, open it, and then he would be able to go out and walk around, like float around in space. He wants to have Mm -hmm. that experience, and he's a billionaire. There you go. So there you go. (laughs) Uh, But he's now been a part of a proposal to service Hubble. Hmm. Could we modify a crew dragon to get up to it, dock to it, and then work from there? to replace the gyros and do some maintenance Mm. on it and do a reboost of it. It's not impossible. And, and because of the low price of Falcon nines, it's even reasonably Mm. cost effective, like relatively speaking, you know, every shuttle flight was a multi-billion dollar operation. This would be hundreds Mm -hmm. of millions. And the issue of course, is that this is, this would be a one of a kind mission. If you mess it up, you may wreck Hubble, but, and and Hubble could be going in, could be operating in a degraded state. Even if they lost mm-hmm. another gyro, there's a couple of tricks they can do with solar balancing and so forth. They would it would limit the amount of number of places that Hubble could point, but they could still get science from yeah. it for a while. Or do you take the chance on a unique servicing mission mm. to keep it running, and perhaps to keep it running for a really long time until, and, and arguably until yeah. Starship flies? Because once Starship is flying. Starship is nine meters mm-hmm. in diameter. You could build a, a space telescope into one of those things that would be bigger yeah. than the James Webb. James Webb is six and a half meters across. Um, and then really bringing it home and celebrating it hanging in the Smithsonian would be awesome. Yeah, that would be wonderful. So uh, that's all okay. I got to say about Hubble. Yeah, James Webb. So let's talk about James Webb. And you specifically asked me, it's like, you're going you're gonna to talk about this, right? Because <laughs> when we did this last year, James Webb had only just been gearing up, right? It launched in in December of 2000, mm-hmm. 2021. It got to L2, its location balanced between the Earth and the Sun in January mm-hmm. of 22. And it took six months or so of checkouts mm. to sort of get it up and running. So by when we were talking about this last year in December of 22, it had really done some checkout images, some initial surveys. Like the pictures mm. were astonishing. It had worked, was working yep. amazing. But the big science stuff had only just gotten started. And they hadn't so, really looked back at the Big Bang yet or anything. <laughs> yeah. They'll because those imaging take yeah. a while, right? And believe me, like James Webb is scheduled out the yin yang now. There's a ton right. of experiments. But we've learned a bunch of things. So they've they've set the records they expected to set. Mm-hmm. So the quick scan stuff they did, like surveying exoplanets they've already done some of that and got some results back that we talked about last year but the longer duration of stuff with things like locating the most distant mm. galaxies so the current understanding in cosmology is that the universe is about 13.4 billion years old maybe 13 13.6 and 
So now you're peering back at light Hmm. from 13 billion years ago. And a few things are important here. One is that the universe continues to expand. And so light that was emitted 13 billion years ago in the visible spectrum isn't in the visible spectrum anymore. It's been stretched. And so it's been red shifted, which is one of the reasons that James Webb is an infrared Hmm. telescope because that's where the old light is. It's in the infrared spectrum. And so, yeah, they found these four ultra distant galaxies. That's 13.4 billion Hmm. year old light way down in the infrared spectrum crazy so it's like there they are we we found them we've done the thing but it, we've also got some problems with what we found and uh that you know before james webb cosmology was pretty comfortable <laughs> right they had this sort of sense of concordance they'd gotten to a place where they call it concordance cosmology this is our little domain here you know we're yeah. all happy and comfortable and what's out there is not gonna <laughs> hurt us it's far away <laughs> well, maybe we should, we should back up. What's cosmology about? What is it? It's really the science of understanding the origin and development yeah. of the universe. So as telescopes have matured over the past hundred, a couple of hundred years, we've been able to look further and further, deeper into space. We found some stuff, and we've been trying to understand mm. the universe around us. You know, the idea that of galaxies, of multiple galaxies, is less than 100 years old. You know, it's taken a while. You know, for a long time, they thought Andromeda was just a nebula, not another mm-hmm. galaxy. Uh, but those things, you know, evolve over time. You, you, you start to learn get this idea of how big is the universe. And it's hard to measure. It's not like you can measure it, right? It's not a mm-hmm. measuring tape. What do, you, what do you do? Like, what, How do you even start to calculate that? And this is where you get into this relationship between cosmology and, and nuclear science or, you know, atomic science. We understand the behavior of atoms pretty well. We study them up close. And we know by frequencies what elements emit what frequencies Mm -hmm. of light. And understanding that stars are essentially fusion engines, that this huge amount of mass that they collect together causes atoms to fuse together, starting with hydrogen, which is the most abundant element, then fuses together into helium. So we need our periodic table. To sort of understand mm-hmm. the chain and when that fusion takes place it emits a particular kind of light and depending on the size the rate of fusion you'll get different frequencies mm-hmm. of light and so by measuring that light we can sort of tell uh, what kind of fusion is taking place and that gives us a sense of its mass now you take its brightness and relative to its brightness you know what its distance is it'll be dimmer right. if it's further away you know by the frequency the kind of fusion mm-hmm. that's taking place, so now you can tell by its uh, by you determine its distance by how right. bright it is, and that's you know the first calculations you start to get uh, for distance, and then we find particular classes of stars. So an astronomer by the name of Henrietta Swan Leavitt, uh, a woman in 1908, identified a set of stars they call the Cepheid mm-hmm. variables. So Cepheid variables change in brightness at a at a standard period so they appear to pulse right okay and this is separate from atmospheric effect they have this pulse um the current understanding today is that these are stars far enough along in their sequence that there's enough helium in their uh in their atmosphere in in the corona that surrounds them that 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 helium, as it blows the electrons off the helium, they become more opaque. It blocks more light, and so it causes it to dim. And as that dimming occurs and it loses some energy, the electrons come back onto the helium, and so it becomes more transparent again. And so there's this throb that happens to these stars at this point in their age, and you can measure that. But it must be at a particularly high frequency, though. I mean, it isn't something that you could probably look at and see it pulsing. It is. No, no, it's very visible. Huh. It's not that fast. Wow. I just think though, um, you know, the the speed at which chemical reactions happen, it would it would be uh very fast. Yeah. And these are high energy plasma reactions too. But you are talking star scale. Yeah, I get it. So and you can well go watch video of They're so big variables and you'll see this. That, yeah, this okay. big pulse. And this is not a pulsar. That's not the same thing as a pulsar. No, that's a different thing. That's a that's a rapidly spinning thing. And it's also useful, mm. but not necessarily useful for distance so much as 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 useful for location. Right. Okay. But uh 
this is before we had all those. We're still talking about optical sensors, right? Radio telescopes haven't right. really started yet. Like we're not able to measure into the gamma frequencies, and, and mm-hmm. at this point, mm-hmm. it's too early. We're very much in optical times. But this, the utilizing Cepheid variables, knowing the frequencies and knowing the pulse rate, helped us determine more accurate distances. Okay. So, and Levitt was the sort of wrote the original paper on this uh, with many other Very people cool. contributing. I wonder, I, it's, I'm always tricky to mention names because there are other, always other folks. We always build on the bat, shoulders of giants. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So let's jump to 20 years later with Edwin right. Hubble. And yes, it's that Hubble. What the Hubble telescope is named for is Edwin Hubble. Yeah. So Hubble in, in 1929, using telescopes, measuring with Cepheid variables, shows that not only we've already now at this point we determined there's multiple galaxies, but that he's also he's the one who figures out redshift. So the further the galaxy is away, the more redshifted it is. Although he's only looking in the optical frequency range, so eventually they redshift off of visible range. But he starts to be able to build the math around redshifting. So redshift looks red, and the further red. away it is, yeah. the redder it looks. As Right. So typically when you talk about ultra large stars, much bigger yeah. than our stars, they are blue giants. They are very much in the blue because they have mm. so much mass. They have a very intense level of fusion. So they're, they're up in the 9,000, 10,000 Kelvin frequency range of ultra okay. blue light. And, but then they are, they are, we're, are so old and so far away, the light has stretched and it's no longer blue. It's become okay. red. And and it's red to us. So, if you were up close, it would be us. blue like everybody else. Yeah. If you were there, a, I mean, again, you're looking yep. back in time. You're talking looking back billions yeah. of years ago, effectively. It. And it, this is also the time when Einstein's written his special mm-hmm. relativity theorems, too. And special relativity talks about the stretching of space-time. And so what what was brilliant about what Hubble was what Hubble was measuring by looking through telescopes is very precise ob- mm-hmm. observations lined up with what special relativity said would be the distortions mm-hmm. too. So we have this theoretical physicist and this cosmologist getting numbers that agree. You know, when we're trying to do science like this, we're looking for multiple strategies mm-hmm. to do measurements because if they all consolidate on the same number, then we have more certainty that number right. is correct. So one of the things that Edwin Hubble figured out was that the further those galaxies were away, the more redshifted okay. they were. And so uh, what he showed was that the universe was expanding and it continued to expand. And it expanded at a particular rate, which for a long time they called Hubble's constant. Hmm. These days we don't call it a constant anymore because there's a lot of debate about whether it's actually a constant. We call it Hubble's parameter. And did they figure that out because the – the stars that were far away were getting more and more red over time. Yes. Well, galaxies too, you know, the galaxies were getting more and more red, but he was measuring their changes Mm -hmm. over time and was able to show their, their, how far away they are and that they are actually expanding. They're getting further away from us. Yeah. In all directions because universe be weird. Yeah. Right. I know it's strange. Uh, It's crazy. Uh, Isn't anything heading toward us? (laughs) <laughs> All kinds of things are, but not at the cosmological okay. scales. So now let's fast forward into the 1960s, and we're getting into radio yeah. astronomy. And as we're attempting to measure the uh, radiation coming off of supernovae, we keep running into this hum Right. And they keep and they think it's like man made to look at all these things, but it takes a while for them to really realize, oh no, that is literally the hum of the universe. The cosmic ohm. Yeah. They might this microwave background yeah. radiation. Uh, and so now they call it the cosmic microwave background, but literally it is the buzz of the big hmm. bang of the initial and it's not really a bang. And it may have actually been really <laughs> tiny initially, although it got a lot bigger. Um but it is literally the background radiation of the initial light okay. of the universe. And it is not even. The hum varies depending on which way you point in the sky. We now have cosmological background radiation maps. Mm. Because the universe wasn't perfectly uniform, a lot of that light got concentrated down. The darker, the cooler areas in the background radiation are where the first galaxies Mm. formed. 
So the process of gravity taking a hold and consolidating these galaxies cooled off that area mm. faster. And so from the background radiation map, we can sort of see where the galaxies sort of appeared. But it also allowed us to use a completely different strategy to measure the age of the universe by the rate of cooling of the uh, of the cosmic rate uh, of the CMB. Sure. And so, and, and up till before James Webb, the two numbers were close enough that it's like, ah, oh, they're within the ra- error rate, so they're okay. probably the same number. The margin of error. That's right. Yeah. Then James Webb showed up and started doing more precise measurements of both. And as the science has been coming in, the numbers have been getting further apart. And the numbers we're talking about are the the redshift rate? Oh, okay. We're talking about the age of the universe. How long has the universe been around? There's a few things that have messed with the 13.7. One is that we're under, as we understand the redshift rate more and more detail, and one of the things that's happened is that the James Webb Space Telescope has been able to show find objects of redshifts in the in the teens, like 13.2, like literally at the beginning of the universe hmm. kind of numbers. And uh, and they're way bigger than they should be. Oh. You know, the idea was when the universe started and it was just protons, there's not a lot of mass concentration there. So the star should have been very mm-hmm. short lived and the those galaxies should be small and, cooler. and simple. And they seem to be large and complex. We're talking like Milky Way class wow. galaxies from 13 billion oh, years ago. From the first two or three percent of the lifespan of the universe as we understand it. Damn you, James Webb telescope. It's <laughs> yes, it's confusing, right? But also, um, and both methods have shown that there's something we really don't yeah. understand. And this is the sort of dark energy, right, dark right. matter part. That the matter that we're seeing in both measurement strategies represents me- less than 5% of all the matter. Right. That there seems to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 25, 26% dark matter, matter we cannot measure, but has gravitational mm. effects. Otherwise, galaxies mm. wouldn't hold together. And that there's a tremendous amount of energy, like 68 to 70% uh, energy that is Mm. immeasurable, but must be there because of the behaviors that we see. Weird. So we really have the sense that we don't know much. Like we're only able to observe a little bit of what's going on on out there. And so the, the, and now as we get into these better, better measurement systems, they're getting further and further apart. But that means that we're due for some new kind of revelation that uh, we have not yet even conceived. And that, and herein lies the crisis. So you now a, a lot of folks that were maybe on the periphery, like one of the proposals running around out there right now is that maybe the universe is twice as old as we think it is, that it's 26 billion years old. And that's why the galaxies are more organized as you get back to the 13 billion year mark. Um, because we have these impossible early galaxies. Now, those are the, the, re- the, the paper proposed that says that has not done enough research to justify such a great, a, a serious statement, right? You know, great proposals require great evidence, so we're not there yet, but you are seeing this sort of fragmentation of ideas. Well, you know, if I apply my imagination, which Einstein says is more important than knowledge, if you apply your imagination, you, I would think that perhaps the the percentage of dark matter and dark energy that we imagine should be applied to the our our uh, estimate of the age of the universe. Well, without a doubt, it is. And that, I mean, this is the thing is, as we got to these estimates, that's why we said there must be some kind of energy we can't measure. Or this wouldn't work. So it's sort of been this catch-all for this. So if you let's say you say that there's sixty percent of the universe is dark matter, dark energy. Well, maybe we should inflate that thirteen point nine by another sixty percent. Well, it's not. It's more, far more than that. It's more than seventy five. Okay, but there's a few things you can go after. One is. Mm. Are our measurements wrong? You know, one of the one of the one of the ideas around the Cepheid model is that we're biased mm-hmm. bright. That because there's so many stars, that every time we track a me- measurement of a star, there are other stars contributing mm-hmm. to that light, and so that might be distorting it. Again, James Webb helps mm-hmm. us address that because it's even yeah. more precise. Uh, those measurements are still ongoing, so maybe we can offset that. Uh, also, you know, we hint, I hinted at maybe it's not Hubble's constant. Maybe at different times in the universe, the expansion rate mm. changed. 
it would be under processes we don't understand. Right. But that's why they're starting to refer to it as a parameter because that parameter may have some variability. Um, maybe there's other states of matter we still don't understand that uh, that impact other areas mm-hmm. of the universe that change its gravitational constants, that change its behavior. All that's happened with James Webb is we've, inter- like most new experiments, they introduce yep. new questions and make us force us to get uh, uncomfortable with our current set of measurements that we have. We to should be that. uncomfortable. So the, the crisis of cosmology is, yeah. I mean, it, listen, we call it a crisis. It's a learning experience. This is a, this is a bunch of science people going, <laughs> yeah. huh? Well, that's yeah, right, odd. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now it's sort of, you know, you had this consensus moment before these new measurements came in. It was like, ah, we're close mm-hmm. enough. And now it's like, maybe we're mm. not that close. Uh, and it's not like this is the last telescope to fly. More will come, and our instruments will continue right. to get better. But uh, we, James Webb has done its job. It has opened our eyes to there is more to yeah. know. And uh, new science is being done right now as we learn more uh, from the measurements we can take from it. It's exciting. It's very cool. That sounds like the end of the geek out. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. I'm sorry it's this long, but that's how much I had to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks again, and we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Plop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a band by the FCC. Yes, I'm a, a